The construction of the Iroquois Theater began in late July of 1903. Its location was strategically placed between the main arteries of Dearborn and Randall Street in the most affluent section of downtown Chicago. Its lavish and opulent accoutrements were spared no expense. Its impressive French-style facade was made of polished granite and bedford stone, and atop the columns there were adorned with epic figures of comedy and tragedy, with the whole edifice crowned with a broken pediment and a large carved bust of the theater's namesake American Indian. Its interior was not only elegant by any standards, but was the epitome of modern technology. The Iroquois Theater had an actual seating capacity of 602 contained within its three audience levels. After several delays, it officially opened on November 23rd of the same year. All theater goers were funneled through its main entrance in order to ensure each had in their possession a paid ticket for entrance. The Iroquois Theater was advertised as being absolutely fireproof. Bills for the Mr. Bluebird performance had this printed on the top right corner. However, there were officials who highly doubted this claim. An editor for Fireproof Magazine looked over the building during its construction. He noted that there was exposed wood trim on everything, a lack of a staged draft shaft, and an inadequate provision of exits. A Chicago fire captain also made an unofficial inspection of the theater after construction was complete. He found that there was no sprinklers, no alarms, no telephones, or water connections. The captain attempted to raise his concerns with the theater fire warden, but in fear for his job, the fire warden refused to bring up the issues with the building owner. Frustrated, the fire captain went to his commanding officer. This officer did nothing for him but refer him back to the same fire warden at the theater. The only firefighting equipment located in the theater was a set of six kill fire extinguishers. These grenade-like containers made of glass were filled with sodium bicarbonate and meant to be thrown at a fire. It was a typical Wednesday in Chicago, Illinois, the exact date being December 30th, 1903. As many children were out of school, the local theater would be a great place to spend some time. A play called Mr. Bluebeard was playing at the newly opened Iroquois Theater. This play was described as an over-the-top musical comedy. The star of the play was a man named Eddie Foy, who was a native to Chicago. Of the nearly, two of the nearly 2,000 people who had attended the play, about 250 could not find seats and were forced to gather in the rear seats on the main floor in the first balcony. It was the beginning of the second act at 3.15 in the afternoon that started the resulting tragedy. A spark from a stage light had ignited a nearby drapery during the performance of In the Pale Moonlight. It quickly spread to the fly gallery above the stage, and panic had started to ensue from the crowd. Eddie Foy attempted to calm the audience and prevent them from panicking, but eventually the fire had spread so rapidly that he had to make his escape. The panicked audience had ran toward any exits they could find, although most were hidden behind curtains. Others were blocked by large metal accordion gates, which had been placed to prevent patrons in the upper levels from sneaking down to the more expensive seats. Crowds were funneling through small truck points into many theater doors, which could only be opened from the inside. The resulting stampede prevented many from escaping, and trapped bodies began to pile and smother. Cast members wanting to escape had opened up a rear stage door. The backdraft from the opening door created a fireball which had instantly killed many of the audience on the upper balconies. Some had managed to find upper level fire escapes, yet they had no exterior ladders that could lead them down. People from the neighboring buildings created plank bridges to assist patrons in escaping. Shortly after the fire, theaters around the country, along with some in Europe, were immediately closed. And in Chicago, a citywide investigation took place that looked into the corruption and alleged bribing of city officials, fire inspectors, and theater owners. Many people were charged with crimes, but all were dismissed using loopholes 
from the theater's owner's lawyers. The fire left an estimated 575 people dead, with 30 dying shortly after from injuries sustained that night. Many of these fatalities were just children, and when firefighters entered after the fire had been put out, corpses could be seen piled 10 high around the nearest doors and windows any victims could find. Many changes came after the fire, with the first being that all exits had to now be clearly marked so that everyone always knew where the nearest exit was to them. The second change to come was that all doors now had to open outward, so no one could get stuck pushed against one while attempting to open it and escape. A man named Carl Prinzler was supposed to be at the theater the day of the fire, but could not make it due to complications. However, after hearing about the tragedy, he thought of an idea that could have helped prevent so many of the countless deaths. It was five years later when he debuted the panic bar, which allowed theaters to lock the doors, preventing people from sneaking in, but also in case of emergency could always be open from the inside. Fire codes have always been the result of insurmountable death tolls. Fire codes are usually not put into legislation unless a considerable amount of fire related deaths have occurred. It's important to understand how fire has directly affected the United States over the years and how events like this impact legislation and what we see today. This event has taught us issues surrounding building construction, the cause of the fire, and egress. This incident has implemented life safety measures in the form of egress paths, exit signs, panic doors, even down to the directional swing of the door as we exit a building. The Iroquois Theater Fire has paved the way for fire codes and regulations involving occupancy limitations, fire suppression installation, and life safety enforcement. Without fire codes and legislation, the fire, life, and safety implications we see today would not have been possible.